You're watching EVH Gear TV, brought to you by Design 39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs. Microphones for EVH Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones, and official Van Halen merchandise is provided by vanhalenstore.com. Now, here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH Gear artist Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, it is the weekend. It felt like it was the weekend yesterday. It's officially Friday. Happy weekend. Happy Friday to you all. Uh, welcome to VH Gear TV. We are live and I'm joined by someone you just very, mo very well know, Blues Saracino. Blues, how are you? Good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the time. Yeah, it's going to be, a, we're going to have a fun evening. I think we're going to have some fun. Uh, you and I had the, um, we could have actually recorded the show off the air and had a really good show. It was that long. It was nope. good. Going to sleep by now. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sleep a lot earlier these days too. Uh, so on show nights, I stay up a little bit later with the boy because he. I like to hang out with him and watch some, you know, cartoons or whatever. Uh, you know, he's old enough he can do that, and he likes dad time too. So, um, but I do go to bed a lot earlier. But we're going to be talking about your career, talking about some film, sure. uh, television, obviously uh, some Eddie Van Halen. He's known to be talked about here on the show, and. <laughs> story or two yeah i think <laughs> we're gonna have a couple and it was been nice i added a few more thanks to some tidbits that you shared with me so fantastic yeah. on that we will jump over to the chat occasionally throughout the evening and say hi to everybody there's a bunch of people jumping in now so hello everyone i will come over and say hi to you and if you have any questions uh for blues uh t try to tag me if you can at evh gear tv in the chat and i'll see them highlighted it'll be a little easier to catch them but i'll certainly try to get as many questions as as, as well so I want to go back a little bit, and uh, hopefully I have some of my facts straight. I'm usually one to screw up everything when it comes to facts. But was it Guitar for the Practicing Musician that was uh, one of the catalysts uh, for your career? Yeah, that was the uh, yeah that was that was the magazine. It was one of at the time those three biggies. It was Guitar for the Practicing Musician, which was actually the the the, the number one selling. It had the biggest circulation, and then there was Guitar Player and Guitar World, mm -hmm. and. My jump off came from um, guitar for the practicing musician. They were the ones that had the, they were the first ones that had the tablature. So okay. They were real popular because it was you know tablature was awesome. You didn't have to guys like me that don't know anything about music technically. It was great. You could just sit there and you know read the read the tabs and get through it. So it worked out well. So so you don't have a lot of uh, theory background. No no I, I'm I'm no I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> no. nothing wrong with that whatsoever. No 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 it's 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 interesting and, and it's. To, to be as honest as I could, like, I actually know a lot as mm -hmm. an overview, but I don't, I, I never studied, I never, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know how to read music, I don't understand music theory, I'm an ear guy, I've always been an ear guy, uh, and it was very interesting the way that started, because people asked me that, the funniest, crazy, the way, it, it's the weird, like, I look back now, and I, I wish I could go back in time and literally slap myself, like, I would be, I would, I would do that, yeah. but what happened was, it all kind of stemmed from, uh, I used to work at this music store in, in Connecticut uh, when I was a kid. My dad got me a work. He, it's this long, crazy story that I won't hold you guys hostage with. But ultimately, oh, it was okay. a place called Creative Strings in Wethersfield, Connecticut. The owner was named Ray D. Champlain, super nice guy. And he had this great, um, this great store called Creative Strings. And my dad, you know, he knew I was into music very early, early on. So he decided, hey, you should let my kid work at the store. And the guy was like, no, you know, and he's like, ah, oh, you should, you should, you know, he kept pestering him. And so my dad did carpeting at the time. That's what I used to do with my dad when we were younger, when I was younger, I, you know, I, during the summers and when I was in school, I do carpeting and flooring, uh, just, you know, making the most out of that blue collar existence. Sure. Uh, and, uh, long story short, he cut a deal with the guy with some flooring and part of the deal was he had to take me and the guy didn't want to take me, but he ended up taking me one day a week. And so I got to, to work at that place. And the funny part was that they were all very, very accomplished school musicians. They were very much on the jazz. They were very, you know, they knew what they were doing. They were great players, really nice people. And I was the antithesis. I was the bare knuckles kid that was like, if you're going that way, I'm going the other way. I liked all the rock stuff. I liked the deep purple and the, the Johnny Winter and all that stuff. So I planted my flag way early. I'm like, if you're going that way, I'm going this way. And it was like this constant battle. Either you were a musician, you know, or you were the street guy. And so... I went completely the opposing way, and uh, so no, I never studied. I did. I would take lessons intermittently, like even Ray, the owner, actually would give me lessons. But I, you know, I take like three lessons, forget it all, and it was hard for me because I already knew how to kind of, you know, throw down on one level. So to sit there and have to reconstruct it from the ground up was so 
just time consuming and ultimately it was just laziness on my part and I really wish I spent more time I guess the theory like my dad and I would talk about it he's like don't learn anything because it's going to stop you it's going to hinder you know your creative what you've got's working don't mess with it you know what I mean it's yeah. like you know it's like old plumbing once that's if it's not leaking just move on you know and don't fix what's not broke you totally you know what I mean and and you know don't think about what you're doing just do it be an artist be creative put the emotion in there do all the stuff that you know, the, the counts, it doesn't matter whether it looks like on paper, it doesn't matter whether it's technically correct. And that's been an interesting theory, like, you know, for my dad, who's built a lot of my gear, I mean, you know, <laughs> how did it work, you know, you know, sparks would fly out, oops, I guess that's not the one to touch, you know, no. and after about, you know, three or four sets of tubes later, you figure it out. And so, like, the, and, and, and I guess it would work, it actually has worked for me, it, but once again, which is like something we touched on earlier, I, it, it, which will be out of context to a lot of people, but what makes some people in life truly incredibly great, like I'm talking away from the crowd completely, at some point the, swindle, the pendulum swings back and then it almost works completely against you. And so the, the, I think in the beginning what gave me that edge, what allowed me to create, just be free and create, uh, I wish at some point I almost kind of split the difference a little bit and had a little bit more of a, of a, of a background if anyone's asking because it would allow me to do what I do now much quicker, meaning it still wouldn't change, but it would it would allow me to come up with a frame at least. And then within that frame, I could work the old way, whereas I'm, I always kind of revert back to doing things just purely on a creative level, like, you know, which has been great for songwriting because, because at the end of the day, I just came home from the NAMM show. Uh, you know, I went in, it, just for, for a day and, and it seems like every three feet, everybody can play these days now. I, I think mm -hmm. with YouTube, Instagram, and I mean, the, the level of just basic accomplishment is so high. Uh, but write me a tune, you know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, make it, make it count. And so it's, it's that whole, you know, you're amazing, but, and then it, it's a thing that falls short. So that being said, I think part of just being an artist is, 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 willing to tear down your own infrastructure and say, hey, you know what, this is how I do it, but it's not the only way, you know what I mean? If, if the person, you know, if John Mayer wants to sit there and he writes his stuff out, well, clearly it's working for him, so that's good on him, you know what I mean? My way, I don't, you know, I don't do it that way. So the interesting part is it came, it was this reoccurring theme that's been throughout my whole life and my whole career is just like, you want to go do it, you just get up and you start doing it and you'll probably do it wrong in the beginning, but sooner or later, you'll figure something out and that's honestly, uh, how I kind of started to develop my own style as we, obviously this is a Van Halen show and we talked about how much, you know, the Van Halen was just a huge game changer in so many levels. But the thing worth touching on at some point is that at some point, you know, it's time to leave it there and then jump off and do your own thing and take that and, and, and move with that. So that is the, uh, that's the backstory, but yes, ultimately guitar for the practicing musician. So, uh, I, I, I remember they called me, uh, and they said, listen, uh, because this is a known story, but I basically did this demo because <laughs> I wanted the, I wanted an endorsement with Ivan as guitars was how it all started. Who uh, wouldn't, right? That, they're pretty big. They At the time, they, keep in mind, this was right when, you know, Saturani was just breaking. Vi was top of the food chain. And, you know, they had Paul Gilbert. They had all these really, I mean, this was, they had Frank Gambale at the time. Yeah. You know, this was the... And Shred was in vogue. I mean, Shred was king. This was, and this was not the new resurgence of this. No, was this was the first time... This, this was the first time you heard that joke. You yeah. Know what I mean? So, uh, and it's it'll just eat up too much time telling the story. But ultimately, another gentleman named Brian Cohen. I always got to give him props because he did really well by me. He owned a place called Brian uh, Brian Brian's Guitars or Brian Guitars. I don't remember in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And he was such a big dealer with. Um, I mean, he was. I mean, he was a business guru. The guy was. He was. He was great. And uh, he was such a big client of, of Hoshino, which was Ibanez, that he said, hey, listen, I know they're looking for talent. And I really, you know, he, I just walked in the store and played one day and he really took notice and, and really felt I had something to offer. So he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get you an appointment with the people at uh, Ibanez. They're looking for new talent and maybe that will turn into something. And that is ultimately how I ended up breaking kind of into the industry. I, I, uh, I met with this gentleman named Rich Lasner, who was the artist relations guy at Hoshino at the time. And he went to Yamaha, and, didn't he? Yeah, that's that's why I went to Yamaha. Yeah, actually, perfect. Yeah, perfect. And they did my own model over there, but he was originally the guy at um, at Ibanez, yeah. and uh, I met with him, and I just, I, it's a, it's just this long sorted story that I've told, but I was so frazzled by day three because I flew myself out there. My the my original boss, which was Ray D. Champlain, said, hey, "Listen, I, you know, we'll put you up, we'll take you, you can do that, but you got to get yourself out there." And so 
everybody kind of really tried to help out as best they could, which I was always very uh, appreciative for. Uh, my parents gave me the money for the ticket. I mean, it was this whole like your typical sob story. <laughs> it was, you know, it was a Hollywood story in the making, but uh, we scrapped everything we had to, to put it together. We took every chance because we didn't really have, there was no backup plan. So um, got out to Nam, which was California, Anaheim. I ended up playing for Rich Lazar. I, I just played with my fingers. I didn't, I, I didn't bring a pick because like, yeah, because you can't find a pick at the Nam show. But yeah, of course. Uh, it was just, it was Sunday morning and everybody, I was just nervous and I didn't know. And so I played with my fingers. And at the time when everybody was, you know, just shredding their brains out, I went the other way. Uh, and I think he took notice of that and liked it. He really felt there was something there. So we basically said, here's what we'll do. Uh, he says, listen, I really like what you're bringing to the table. He says, but you know, reality is you don't have a lot of exposure at the moment. So, you know, endorsements work on exposure. It's a, it's a two way street, you know, which is totally understandable. He says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to send you a guitar, you know, which is all I needed to hear. Once I heard guitar, the rest of it was, wah, 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 yep. wah, I didn't care. But he says, we'll send you a guitar. And he says, listen, do something, you know, if you can I don't know, make like a tape we can use as a sales tool or something. And I said, say no more. And he actually followed through. I got a call about a week later. Hi, this is Rich Lasner. I'm going to send you the guitar. As a matter of fact, I have the original sales slip. I kept it. I'm not like a, I'm not a keeper of things. As a matter of fact, I don't keep anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I keep very little. Uh, now that I have kids, I keep more because obviously it's, it's important. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but I did keep, I have the original sales slip. I'll put it on Instagram or something like that at some mm -hmm. point. You guys can not be impressed by it. But, um, I'm sure we will. So, uh, uh, so ultimately uh, he did send the guitar and then I sat in my parents, I lived in my parents' garage in Middletown, Connecticut at the time because it was a great deal. I got out, they, my parents were very, uh, I was pretty much, a, I was a good kid. I didn't really get in any trouble to, to speak of. So the, the more I behaved, the more freedom they kind of gave me to it got to the point where I just lived in the garage. It was great. I'd come and go. I could, you know, I could have girls over. They didn't care. I was like, this is the best deal ever. You know, yeah. Not the girls wanted to come hang out in the garage, but you know, <laughs> But it worked out. It actually worked out really well. And uh, uh, so anyways, I made this tape, uh, this tape with uh, me and a drummer. We made this tape on a Tascam four track. Maybe I think it was a Clarion four track was the original one. And then I went to Tascam. But ultimately, I made this tape. I sent it in. Rich is like, man, this thing's great. We love it. This is going to work perfect. He says, hey, can you make another one? And I said, sure. And so I made a second one. It was just me. Just, you know, second you hit play, it was just, you just go for it. And then, um, he just loved it. And then I, he asked for a third one. By this time, I was kind of like, I kind of felt like I earned the guitar at this point. I was yeah. kind of like, man, I'm kind of, I had kind of won. It, and then I was slowly giving the chips back to the, to the house there. So, yeah. Uh, but the, but what came out of it is, uh, I guess my point for, for saying this, if there's young players uh, watching this, which hopefully there are, uh, I took the initiative. I made the tapes. I did really put my best foot forward. Uh, with what I had to work with at the time, it didn't have very much at all. I literally had a four track and a microphone and I lived next to a coal bin in my parents' garage. Seriously, mm -hmm. crazy. Uh, but I made the tape and the, the moral of the story, the feel good hit of the summer is that that tape, those first three songs circulated throughout the industry. I think that tape because Ibanez at the time was, uh, or maybe still is, was very closely associated with DiMarzio. Mm -hmm. It got to a gentleman named Steve Blucher over at DiMarzio and he, took the tape and gave it to John Sticks, which was the editor-in-chief of guitar for the practicing musician. And unbeknownst to me, they were looking for someone to launch their guitar. It was a great idea. They had this magazine that had 150,000 people each month. That was their circulation. Stupid they figured back it, then. Which was yeah, it's huge. I mean, everybody else was like 70, mm -hmm. then 90, and they were like 150 because they had the tablature. They were tied in with Cherry Lane. So what happened was they controlled the publishing, meaning they couldn't, you know, Guitar World, they got, you know, we're going we're gonna to give you Guns, Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine, for then for you guys, yeah, you can have the drum solo. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So it was like, you know, so everybody kind of would, would do that. And ultimately, my point is that that tape got in this, uh, the, the, the guy's hands, and they called me and said, hey, listen, is this really you playing? Because I, I was just 15 at the time. And I said, yeah, it's me playing. He says, well, I'll tell you what, if you come to, I think it was... New Rochelle or Poughkeepsie, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But um, they said, if you come and you play for us in the office, and it is really you playing, then we'll offer you a, a deal. And I was like, fine. I grabbed Brian Cohen, who was would later turned into my, my manager, because I figured he got me this far. He's doing great. And we went down there, and I played for him, and they said, okay. And I was offered a record deal, and, and it was 
Brian was really smart about it. And what he did is he got worked it out where he did a one record deal, which is kind of unheard of because yes. no one wants to promote you and then you can just, you're free to go yep. elsewhere. But in all honesty, it was such a new, they were so new to it and I was so new to it. And, you know, I was underage at the time. It was just weird. So everybody kind of said, hey, let's just do a record in good faith and let's see if it does. And obviously if it's a win-win, we'll talk and we'll move forward. And if not, then, you know, hey, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, on your so, way, yeah. Which was, in, so the crazy part of the whole uh, long-winded story that you guys are probably sleeping through is that um, those first three songs are the first three songs on my record. I had to redo them because the, the which the sad part is the demo tape is way better. <laughs> it's oh, like yeah. leagues better because it's just, they always are. It's just the first time it was, it was fire, raw yet fire. more polished. Yeah, it just was. And you have to go back and recreate it. It's really hard. It's like mm-hmm. trying to tell the joke the second time. It's like, ah, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's always been that way. Music is, you know, music is not as much as everybody wants to make it commerce, uh, which I get because that's what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really not. And I'll be tr- straight honest with you. Some days I, you know, man, some days I'm on fire and I'm like, who is this guy? And other days I'm like, whoo, interesting. You know what I mean? So, and that's just anybody that says otherwise is maybe not being honest with themselves. Uh, so, uh, that, so my point is I'm glad I put the effort into it because the first three songs, even though I, you know, it wasn't about the guitar anymore. It was really about getting the deal. It was either doing that deal or do a deal with Michael Bolton. And that's a whole nother story for another podcast. Yeah. Uh, but so through that became the one record. And then I started getting, now it made sense. Now I went back to Rich over at Ibit as I said, Hey man, I'll tell you what, I'm doing a record. I can put your record on, I, mean, I can put your your guitar on the cover of my record. He's like, all right, now we got something to work with. And so now it became, now the game is on meaning and, and, and what happened much like to, it's no different than social media today. It mm-hmm. was just, I was just trying to capitalize on the social media of my time, which was magazine. It was hard copy. It was print because what happened was, this is the truth. This is a life lesson, man. This is the, the Kardashian lesson of life. It's not how popular you are. It's how popular you are perceived to be. Yes. So what would happen was, you know, here's Eddie Van Halen. He's on the cover. Awesome. Then you open up and he's on the inside and they have the magazine. He's maybe in it two, three more times. So he's in it three or four times. But I've got endorsements. So now I'm in it three or four times. I'm in a full, you know, full page, you know, five color, full page ad. So if you're a kid sitting in Des Moines, Iowa, and you open up and there's Eddie on the cover, and then you open up and oh, oh snap, there's blues, you know, and you keep going all of a sudden. What happened? It's kind of like on TV. We're all this, we're all this big on TV. It doesn't matter, you know, how many times have you met? your famous movie star and the guy's a midget. You're like, what? Or short mm-hmm. person or whatever, whatever we're going with. Mm-hmm. But anyways, the point is, is that, so in my own way, I was just trying to work with the opportunities that were given me, which was, which was guitar. And to be totally honest with you, I, I, <laughs> guitar was just one of the tools in the, in, in the toolbox. To be honest with you, I've always been more of a songwriter or a, an overview guy. I always felt that was the strongest point. The guitar was just the details. And the guitar was always my favorite. It was always the most fun. But it was just a, a means to an end, to be real honest with you guys. I was like, you know, uh, you know, I was always better at guitar than anything else. So that's kind of uh, as far as in my skill set. So like I didn't start singing to much later. And because I was just like, ah, I don't like the way I sound. And I just couldn't do it to the level I was, I was expecting. And so whereas the guitar, I kind of could. So that's, that became the default. But so the long and short of it is one record turns into two, which turns into three. And those are the three solo records, which was uh, what I did. And they were always, uh, just keep in mind, the first record was, you know, I was a kid living in Connecticut, you know, living in my parents' garage, handing out cassettes to people. And then I got a chance to make a CD with color on it. And then I got to be a magazine. So it was always just the next step. It was just, you know, there was really no... And, and trust me, I tried to plan a career as much as anybody. I was as motivated as any human being could ever be. It just you just had to work with whatever whatever door opened. That's what I went through. So those are the records. That's the backlog. <laughs> it's fantastic. And you know, it's funny too. I don't talk about this a lot as far as magazines on the show. I talk about how the you know the music medium has changed so much. Now we don't even have our physical copies of things anymore, unless you know you go out of your way to get a record or you know to physically buy a CD. Everything's all digital. But one thing I've never really approached on the show is the magazines. I've I live in a digital world and I embrace it. I'm pretty cool with it. But I still like the the touchy feely. Uh, if I get a tablature book or something, I like to have the book as opposed to looking at it on my devices. But I think another thing where kids are disconnected these days, and this is the first time I've ever mentioned on the show, is 
the guitar magazines of the day. Do you remember back in the day? Obviously, well, I mean, it was Guitar for the Practicing Musician who discovered you, but that was one of the bigger magazines, obviously. And like you say, with the tablature, there's a lot of kids that couldn't even afford to buy the magazines. I mean, now they're like ten bucks in in Canada. They were probably two fifty back then, or something like that. But they still couldn't afford it. And the kids would rush down to the ma- magazine store and uh, you know drool over the covers, drool, and they you know they'd look uh, go up to an Eddie Van Halen page. Okay, he does this and this and this. They'd run home, practice it, run back to the magazine store because they couldn't buy the magazine or they would steal sure. the magazine, you know. I, know I, was, I was that kid. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was always, you know, I, I, keep in mind, a lot of, uh, so there's two things that we, because you brought up a great point, which is the tactile experience. And, and here's what I'll say to new kids coming up, you know, like, you know, for example, I've got a mini MOOC, you know, I don't even play keyboards, I'm, I'm suck, you know, MIDI saves me, I'm, I'm awesome with MIDI, MIDI machine, <laughs> you know. But my point is, what you're lacking uh, in this whole virtual world, as much as everybody has so much access to so much information, there's two things that I think are worth touching upon, which, you know, is, is kind of pretty obvious. But a lot of times music, in all honesty, is a happy accident. I mean, to be sure. any, I mean, I don't, I, I can, I mean, listen, if you ever get any, anybody on the show that could prove me otherwise, like, I can't imagine Ed lays in bed like this and wakes up and says, boom, eruption, got it, done. You know what I mean? No, yeah. he's noodling. He's doing something. This works. This inspires me. It's an ebb and a flow. That's how music's created. I mean, I, I would like to think that that's got to be it. So what you miss by uh, by having the digital thing is like, you know, there's something about just wrenching on the knobs. There's something about the, the, the happy accidents. There's something about doing things improperly. For example, now what I've noticed, and maybe this is what we touched on earlier, is like even walking around the show everybody's great. They all play the, you know, they all play, play little wing perfectly. The problem is, which is great because the, I guess the upside is that the knowledge base is, is, is there and, 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 and it works. But what you're missing is that the bulk of the heroes that you're probably emulating really were trying to do something and they took a left turn somewhere because they couldn't quite get there. And that became the thing that you're now copying. You're now copying you know, a watered down version of, you know, if, if Van Halen was trying to be Eric Clapton or Jeff Beck or Chuck Berry for that matter, you know, you're getting his interpretation of that. And then you're taking his interpretation as the truth. But the reality is that was maybe not even the most accurate. So what happens is that a lot of people are missing that. That's, and I guess maybe that's why there's a lot of perfection out there, but not necessarily, not necessarily any artistry. And I think that's the interesting part. And, you know, part of, you know, it's like, for example, I, you know, I came up with the, that amp, the whole Dirty Boy amp with the very back, and that became, <laughs> that started out of two Marshalls, where I would literally only vary out one of the amps out of two, and everybody thought I was using two amps, but I wasn't. I was driving one into the other, which you shouldn't do. No one should do that. You're not supposed to do that. But I did it, and that's how it worked. Half the licks that maybe people are copying off mine is, is, is a chopped version of somebody else's riff that I couldn't get right because I didn't have the access to it, so I had to take it and... and, and make something out of it. And so I thought that was interesting. And I think a lot of that spirit is kind of that Eddie Van Halen spirit. He just, you know, I don't think he was worried about the wrapping paper. He just wanted the gift. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he nailed the pickup in the guitar if that's what it took. He didn't, he wasn't precious about it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's almost like, and, and that's changed. Now an old Strat is worth, let's say, you know, 12 to 18 grand. You're not about to take that Strat and stop hogging it out and throw a pickup in there. You know, you're not going to do that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So it's weird. As much as things have progressed on one level, they've you've lost the art and the other levels. So it'll be interesting to see how the, the current new generation and what that morphs into. You know, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. But I, much like you, didn't have access to a lot of stuff, so I just had to make it work. And that's what became that sound. And that was it, you know? I agree. And I remember one of the catalysts for me as a young musician growing up was right at that same era when that magazine came out. And I forget what Van Halen song it was, but it was, you know, they didn't break right out of the gate with Van Halen as their tablature, you know, their licensing royalties and all the stuff they'd have to pay. But eventually there was a Van Halen song in one of those, mag- and Guitar for the Practicing Musician. I remember going down to the magazine store and I was going to buy it. And I, I did buy it. My buddy's with me. And our parents would drive us into the city and drop us off and we'd hang out in the city until our parents would come and get us. It was a big deal for us. And I bought the magazine and uh, my friend says to me, you're never going to learn that song. And be, and I'll never ever forget it. And I did. Uh, I played it. Be- I played it better as a younger adult than I can now. But because he said I couldn't do it, and don't right. and let that be an example to anyone. When anyone says you can't do it, you need to do it. You need to do it for yourself. You don't need to do it to rub it in their face. But you, you should never be told you can't do something. And that's not just guitar. That's that's anything in life. You can't be a painter. You can't be a girl soccer or a girl football player or blah blah blah. Right? Yeah, yeah totally. And I, and I think I think the biggest problem I had is like. 
it was always the grass is greener. Like I can honestly tell you guys just without naming names or getting into details, sure. it's like as my career would rise, you know, and I, I would always get in one gig and I'd be like, wow, this gig's kind of wacky. I don't, oof, this is how it's run. When I get to that next gig, that's when it's going to kick in gear. Then I'd get like to the next gig and I'm like, oof, this is run even worse. And I'm getting it. It's it like literally I'm playing stadiums and it's, it's insane. Like the stuff that goes on, it's, it's, so my point is don't wait. You just kind of have to do it. It's never, you know, you can't live your life via Instagram, meaning like no one ever posts their losses. You're not, you know, you don't, you've got a picture of me with my vintage guitar doing this or whatever. You don't have a picture of me out there when my water heater just broke and I got two wrenches in my hand and, you know, my kids thrown up and, you know, it's, you're not getting that. You know what I mean? It's like Facebook, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's Valentine's day and they love each other and they got, and then they're divorced two months later. You yeah. know what I mean? So oh, it's yeah. kind of like, it's, it's not, that's just not the way it is. So I guess if I, if, if my point is, and I've seen it, I mean, believe me, I've, I've been on both sides of the fence. I mean, I've been in situations where, I mean, the book I could write or the movie I could make would literally melt you. I mean, like it's insane the stuff <laughs> that goes on. But the point is, is that you just forge forward. You just keep moving. You just do it. You just go out there. It's never going to be perfect. You know, it's so funny. I, I remember going at one point just as an artist, I, I got done, I was playing, I got done playing stadiums. I lo- remember flying in first class, you know, drinking the orange juice, just doing the stadium tour. It was insane playing like rock and Rio where it's like they wheel my cab off and they wheel Joe Perry's in. And I'm like, Whoa, how did this happen? This is crazy. You know? And six months later I'm driving around in a Pontiac Sunbird doing like an X games tour, like with bikes that are jumping over us while dirt's in our faces. And I'm just going, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's there, 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 it's never perfect. You just forge forward and you just make what you can out of it. And, and that is the industry. And it's, it's so funny. I've seen people that I've, idolized i kid you not like idolize like whoa i've literally seen him working at the mall mm-hmm. dead serious. like yeah. crazy you're like oh like it's awkward you just kind of keep, <laughs> you just yeah. keep walking because you're like oh this is weird this is weird this is weird don't, see, don't make see, eye you know, contact I mean, i'm talking I, I mean people that are so good it would bum you out you know so such is life you just kind of forge forward and, and it, like you know even we talked about like the whole van halen thing obviously like i thought an interesting uh point was that uh Obviously, when, when, when the whole Van Halen kicked in for me, I, I was it was very age appropriate. I think, you know, I started playing guitar when I was about nine. And it was funny, from nine to 13 was kind of during those four years was really kind of like the, that that was the, the time. Those four years is when it all kind of just all the foundation really kind of took place. And then from then on, it was really just refining it and kind of locking it down to something. So at the time, because of my age. You know, it was, you're, you're emulating your heroes. You're trying to figure it all out. And, and, and so the interesting part was like, I was always kind of like, I was always been just a rock guy. Like I was always into the deep purple and the, the Johnny winners and the Pat Travers and all the early ZZ top, you know, that's the stuff for me that it was like, I liked the guitar. The music had, the guitar had a great part in it when, you know, during the eighties when Peter Gabriel was popular, I, you know, I play in a cover band and I'm like, plinky, plink, plink. There was, there was nothing there was no heavy lifting for the guitar to do. You were just, you, you were just garnish on the plate. Mm-hmm. So then Van Halen kicks in and I was like, Oh, here we go. You know, it made sense because one, uh, I liked all the early, um, I liked all that Southern rock bands like Molly Hatchet and, and you know, Marshall Tucker. And there's this band point blank. There's just one record called the hard way. They're from Texas. These, I think they're from Texas. I don't even know. I don't, I don't want to say it. it's not true. Uh, but there's they, these guys, those guitar players are phenomenal. They've got, uh, these guys are they're, they're great. I highly recommend it's a hard find, but you can go on YouTube now. It's a band called Point Blank. The album's called The Hard Way. They got a live song called Thank You Mama, okay. which is, you know, I don't know if it's live or not. I mean, it's supposed to be live, but my point is those guitar players are great. They have great guitar sounds and they're boogie players. You know I mean, they got that swing, they got that shuffle. So I was into that stuff. I was into the, all that, you know, I didn't, I wasn't the ZZ Top guy, you know, when, once they start dressing from the gift shop, I'm out, I'm done, you know what I mean? Like, to me, it was the early stuff when they were doing all the, you know, when it was the, the 100 Waters Wide Open and all that, you know, Arrested While Driving While Blind at Tejas, that whole, that was, to me, sonically was was where it was. And so, when Van Halen hit, when I when I found out about it, they were probably out, uh, I probably didn't catch on for until, like, the second or third record, but when they hit, just sonically, it was such a... Uh, 
it was such the next gear for me. Like, you know, it went from like, you know, Pat Travers with like a cool, you know, cool guitar sound, skinny with some phaser on it, or Johnny Winter with that micro thin sound. All of a sudden, this guitar comes out. And honestly, even more than just the playing and the tricks and all that stuff that went with it, the sonics were just like a wall. And that, even though I'm a guitar guy, it was really this, it was really that, that, just that I've never heard anything quite sound like that. You know, I mean, it was such a full spectrum guitar sound. And so for me, when that hit, I was like, oh, here we go. That was a big turning point for me. I mean, there was very, because you got to realize the Hendrix thing had already, you know, it, it's so funny too, because I remember when I was playing, now it's like anything Hendrix does is just instantly, you know, iconic status. But at the time, when, like, you know, when you're talking like the late 70s, early 80s, people were like, ah, eh, Hendrix, he's kind of, I don't know, he's, you know, he, he'd already kind of, it didn't get a chance to hit that 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 legendary status yet. I just I remember having conversations with people like, yeah, you know, it's a little loose, it's a little sloppy. I'm like, what? Like, you know, it was, I was like, sounds good to me, man. But so, and same thing with Clapton. Yeah, Clapton's okay, you know. And then so it was just an interesting thing. And now, you know, 30 years later, now it's like, oh, if they even breathe, it's it's considered iconic. But my point was that it was really the sonics of that guitar. I could never figure out with what gear was available to me at the time. You know, I had a, I had like an Ampeg V4 and an MXR Distortion Plus. Man, it sounded like razor blades dipped in glass. It was horrible, you know. And uh, <laughs> this guy had it all. He had so for me, probably more than than any of the other stuff, at least from my point with the whole Van Halen angle, was that he had that tight low end, and you could play leads on it. Like he could just, he was like, he could just go from rhythm or lead. It didn't I didn't if he was stepping on a pedal, I didn't hear it. It just sounded like. You know, it was all there. You want to clean it up, just turn it down. So it was almost like everything was at his fingertips. And then he had such a, uh, he had the skill so mastered that he could just push it where he wanted, at least in, in my opinion. So for me, to be real honest with you guys, that was the Van Halen, that was really the aspect of Van Halen that was appealing to me. And then the, the, the so I was totally into it. And then the interesting part, which we touched base was uh, very briefly, was that because of my age, of course, you know, he came out, that was the first concert I ever saw, it was 1984. My dad took me to go see it, and uh, <laughs> this is so crazy. Uh, we were doing, car, you know, we were doing Florida, because that's what we did. I was doing, I was working with my dad, because I had to pay for the ticket, you know, they, you know, gotta, gotta earn your way, and so, and I was totally good with that. So, we're at this lady's house, really nice, she was like an older lady, and we were doing the car thing, and I was like, Dad, you know, we gotta go to that concert, it starts at 7.30, and it's like, you know, one in the afternoon, my dad's like, don't worry, we'll get there, and the lady goes, Oh, your, your, your son sure is excited. Has he got a date tonight? And my dad's like, no, man, he's going to a Van Halen concert. <laughs> you know? And so it was just funny that that was the first concert. But my point of it was that because of the age I was at, it made a big impact. And then, of course, he came out and just his approach to guitar and what he could do with it the whole the way that he could. He had a guitar that stayed in tune, man. I had crappy old vintage strats that probably worth more than a small car now. Those things sucked for staying in tune. So it was like, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've traded the old, you know, 60, 62 slab board strat. I didn't even want that thing. Get rid of that. I would gladly trade it for the hot pink Jackson. Like, give me that action. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that had a killer. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I remember when Floyd Roses uh, just came out, you couldn't even get them. They were like 350 bucks just to get a Floyd Rose. So you had to buy a Kramer. And I bought, I, I've had so many Kramers and they were, the ones I had, I mean, the ones I had were so bad. They were, they, I mean, I was there since day one where they made them, uh, they were made in New Jersey and they actually made some in Connecticut and the guy, Dennis Berardi was the president. He came in the store and at one point he was supposed to give me a neck. I, I've got such crazy stories. that will just, I don't know if they'll translate to, but um, they were built so bad that I pulled one apart and it had a quarter for a neck shim. For a shim? <laughs> I remember thinking, that's strong, man. It's a strong move. But my point is, and the, and the funny thing which I, which we had touched base was that what I liked about it was the way the sound could be so distorted but yet so clear and easy yeah. to play. And you could tell he wasn't sweating. He wasn't pushing. He was just doing it. And so the funny part about it was that I always, you know, like everybody else at that time, I would seek to get a sound or a sound like that and a friend of mine, which we talked about, a friend of mine, Mike Tempesta, who uh, he played in bands like Power Man 5000, and uh, he he had a Marshall Plexi, uh, and he's like, hey, you got to come check this thing out. It sounds just like the, the Van Halen one, and it was pretty close. I mean, it was probably the closest. It was a 100-watt Plexi. I think, I think George Lynch bought it, if I recall correctly, but uh, 
he had it and we fired it up and, and, and it literally did. We just dimed it and it sounded great. And my point of the whole story was this, which is interesting. So if people are paying attention to anything, was this, that when I play it, and it really did, it was pretty close to, I mean, it wasn't exactly, it was a little light in the bottom, but it was close. I mean, it was really pretty close. And the crazy part about it for me, which was amazing and disheartening at the same time, was that when I played the Van Halen riffs, they sounded great. It was awesome. And the second I played anything other than Van Halen, it wasn't. Yeah. Like, you know, so it kind of, it, it was that moment. It was just a, a definitely a, a corner turner. I mean, it was as far as I had, I had definitely stopped emulating the Van Halen stuff because I had kind of just as because I couldn't do what he did and it didn't apply to what I did I was already on my journey of getting my own guitar sound I was I was well in, into that but as far as you in the back of your head you're always kind of like oh I'd like to hear what that sounds like and ever since that day I've never gone after that sound because I realize it's just it's like a shirt that looks amazing on you and then it should look good on me when I order it in the catalog <laughs> And then I, it should work. You know, all the girls say it looks great. And I get it home and I put it on and it just doesn't work. It's just, and so it's interesting that that was kind of an interesting page turner that it, it you know, just didn't work. Like you, you're doing whatever riff you're doing, whatever band, it just, it didn't work. And it sure didn't work for my stuff. You know what I mean? So it was interesting. So that, you know, you spent, I spent so much time trying to you know, waiting for that, once again, the grass is greener theory. And then when I got there, and even though it wasn't exactly his amp, or his, sure. but it was pretty damn close. I guarantee you if he had picked it up, <laughs> he would have done some damage with that sound, you know? And it was a swing and a miss for me. It was weird. So there you go. I think it's good, though, the fact that you discovered it at the time that you did, because, you know, a lot of us, um, I, I'll put myself in the same boat as well, too, we're still chasing, and we're never going to get it. And as soon as we even think we get close to it, Eddie's come out with something again, and I mean, he could play a pig nose, he can play a Marshall, he can play a, a Fender, he can play whatever, and he's still going to sound like that's that the man. He's going because he is the man. Uh, but you discovered yeah. early enough that you you okay, you reached that plateau, you got to play Mike's amp, it had the sound, and it's like okay, cool. All right, now I'm now I've, I'm here. Now I can go over the other side and and discover you know my thing, which which is good that you did it. It was a good turning point for you. Yeah, it was, and I think we also touched base on this, like. I think by nature, and, and I get it because I'm, I'm guilty of it, uh, you know, less so now, but definitely when I was in my formative years, let's say, mm -hmm. you're emulating, you know, you see, you know, whatever I see, you know, you see Ingve, remember when Ingve came out, I'm not lying, I may have scalloped a strat or two, you know what I mean? Because it was like, you see this guy and he's got the skill set and you're like, that's awesome, I'd love to be able to incorporate that. And so you start chasing that. But what I'm gonna tell everybody that cares to listen uh, is that, a lot of it, and this is just, it's part of being an artist, and I figured this out really early, and that's kind of like the second I kind of got to like, by the time I hit about 13, I kind of figured it out real quick, and I was like, okay, I'm done. Meaning like this, what it came down to was this, a lot of times, like I'll give you a perfect example, if you go on an old pickup truck, and you're driving on the farm, and you want to take a left, you have to turn that thing about six times, man, to make that thing even veer to the left. You no know, power steering. No power steering, and it's old, and it's clunky. And so, whereas you get in a new car, you just breathe, and you're already in, on, on the median. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the point is, a lot of the playing style, a lot of my style developed. Like, the reason why, you know, I use heavy strings and I hit on the guitar was because, in all honesty, when I was learning to play guitar and form my style, there was no, there really was no gain. You didn't have gain. You, you had, like, master volumes, but they were horrible sounding. They just sounded like ice picks. So... You know, I had to sit there and take an old amp and throw a blanket over it and turn it up and stick it in the corner. And then it had kind of a, you know, and so, but in, in order to get more gain, you just had to hit it harder. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So that's where that was my sound, you know? And so my point is, everybody's so busy copying Jimi Hendrix. And my point is, trust me, until you, you know, you'll get a fuzz face and you'll plug it in and you realize, man, that sounds like mud. I don't get it. Because... The reality is, is that, you know, he's got his guitar tuned down half a step. He's running into the mark. The Marshalls, honestly, at that point, are just acting as super loud power amps. You know, mm -hmm. you're really getting your sound from the fuzz face, which has got kind of a sloppy bottom end. So you adjust to it. And my point is, is that I assure you, whatever your hero is, whoever, let's insert hero name here. If he hands you his chord and says, here you go, have at it, you'll realize that it's he boxed it out to do what he does. I guarantee you Ray Vaughn's, Stevie Ray Vaughn's guitar is, you know, He's the only guy that had a Strat sound that didn't have that skittly, crappy top end. Like his sound, to me, kind of like a Les Paul, but but a Strat. You know what I mean? Mm. And so, but of course, he's running through 15s. He's running through it. It's you know. So 
my point is everybody spends way too much time just chasing. And, and my point is when you get there, whatever it is, you know, if you go to play superstition, you're not playing out in a clavinet, man. It's not, it's not going to sound right. You know what I mean? You know, you know, take anybody. So a lot of these people that you love and admire, they're, they're taking what they had available to them and they're doing something and that's, they're creating that sound. And I assure you that it just doesn't work. Like, like my biggest pet peeve, not that it's a pet peeve, because it's really not, but like, I hear a lot of new artists, they're like, you know, I'm going to make like a blues record. And I hear it and like every drum is my dub. And it's like, it sounds to me like guitar center. I mean, it's just rough. You know I mean? Yeah. Like, I like the records where there's like, you know, there's room sound. Two, two ribbon mics in the room and it's sloppy and it moves and it sloshes. And who, get, who cares? You know what I mean? Like the second, and I feel bad because what happens is that it's no different. Like I, I, I play. I toured with Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker, and he had the old yes. blood wigs, and he kept real big. I'd get on a kit, you know. He and I, man, we just we, oh man, we we go at it. it was, Ginger and I did not. Uh, <laughs> we're not gonna, you know. It's interesting, but anyways, you know. So anyways, like you know, he wouldn't even show for sound check. So there I am sitting there playing the drums and sound check, just because I was like, it's cool. And my point is, it has a sound, and like it was part of his sound. And I see him now, and he's on a set of new DWs with the clickety clack sound. It's like, and it's it, it doesn't work. It's like seeing your favorite. Uh, band, you know, they, they're reuniting 30 years later and they're playing like Parker Fly guitars and you're like, what? I don't <laughs> yeah. get it. You know, what I mean? it's like, you know, it's, and I'm not saying the sound is clearly in the hands, as you said, Ed on, on a classical guitar as, as he's done, sounds like him, I get that. But, you know, it's, it's, there's something to be said for just, you play to the sounds and that's part of being the artist is you, you adapt. Music is not a, music is not a linear situation. It's an ebb and a flow. And so part of it is, is, you know, working with the sounds, you play to the sounds. When we track records, you know, I'll, when I track drummers, I feed the sound back into their headphones so they can play off the compression, they can play off the distortion, they can play off this, they can work with what they've got because you'll hit the drums differently. If you hit the drums differently, they sound differently. Of you know, course. it's like great drummers. I mean, you would think drumming is such a static sport. It's not. Why do you think Alex Van Halen has that boing snare drum that everybody, you know, recognizes because he, he, you know, kills he crushes it. it? I'm sorry. He kills it. He yeah, can't. he kills it, but he doesn't hit so hard that he chokes the drums. No, you know, nope. I know because you know, I, I know the you know the you know my, one of the guys I work with all the time was the last engineer. He you know he even said, man, the guy's he just he's a you know he's a he's a drumming D'Artagnan. I mean, the guy's you know he's his ability is through the roof, and so it's all it all goes hand in hand. Is my point, and so I guess if I had to give anybody any advice, is it's definitely great to emulate to get out the door, but at some point you you'll realize that it it, it it will only take you so far and. It, it just it doesn't work that way. There's no magic fix for it. So I know. agree, and like you say too, with the with the abundance of people learning easier today with the internet and things like that too, it's like if I can try to make a connection between um, you know music and an abundance out there. It's cool to see young kids getting on guitar, uh, adults picking up guitar and instruments for the first time. But there's like a bunch of conversations going on, and it's almost like we can all download the Rosetta Stones or whatever uh, language learning tutorials, and we can all learn to speak a sentence in, in probably twelve different languages. But can we have a really intellectual conversation with one another of, of different languages? And that's what the problem is, I think, with some musicians today. Um, and I'll, uh, many, I'm guilty of it, too. You know, you get a vocabulary that's only so far. And once you've said, I like spaghetti in a different language three times, well, that gets old pretty quick, right? Let's have a nice intellectual conversation. And that's where the musicians need to, um, you know, uh, uh, stop copying as, as much and... And here again, I'm in the guilt circle. Right, here. I always put myself in the guilt circle, um, and try to find take that that right turn, left turn, as you described earlier. Learn the uh, increase the vocabulary, the musical vocabulary, and culture of vocabulary, which will help you as well too. But I think a lot of us need to do that. Yeah, and, I, and honestly, it's the it's the interaction. I mean, it's it's a double edged sword because what happens is technology is great. I mean, here I am, I get to interact with you and mm -hmm. whoever else is. Is, you know, which is amazing. I mean, you could never do that before. Nope. The downside is you lose. It's like even now making records. I do, you know, I, I, I make music, you know, for television and film. That's my world. I mean, half the time you're hearing stuff on TV, it's me doing everything, which is great. Mm -hmm. But you miss that play. You miss that interaction. You miss that, you know, the way. And it's not, it's not just because things were old because they were good. I mean, I'll be honest with you, man. If I had to go back to cutting on tape, oh, I know. I don't, just sitting there. Rewinding, just to cut another guitar solo. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah. so there's pros and cons, but but it's it's like anything else. So I I think it's going to be interesting to see how it progresses and where where the next phase is going to be. You definitely are missing certain things as far as like the interaction and you know 
being able to build off things, being able to not get things proper, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, is, 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 is the way. I mean, let's be honest, when the Beatles came along, they, they were the first guys to start close micing stuff. Everybody else was putting their mics 15 feet back and they had the rules, you couldn't do that. These guys are sitting there and jamming mics, a couple of people are losing their minds and they're going, no man, that's the sound. And so, you know, you need to have that. It's, it's harder to become more cavalier because now, like I'll give you an example, like when, you know, <laughs> you know, of course, there was such limited information. Everybody's like, you've got to take an amplifier and then Variac it. And I didn't know what Variac was. I didn't realize I was already Variacing stuff. I thought of Variac. I didn't realize I thought I didn't realize it was like a brand of something. I already had a dimmer and I was dimming my amps because I I couldn't, they were just too loud. I kept blowing out the speakers. So but the interesting part was I read an interview where like, yeah, you turn them up. I can't tell you how many times I'm running an amp at 130 volts. And I'm like, ooh not the move you know what i mean you just didn't realize it and how much of the sound doesn't come from the very act like i'll be totally honest with you guys whether you take an amp at one you know 120 whatever 110 or they come up with the wall it's ranges between 117 or 121 volts usually and you very act it down the tone doesn't change it's really more the feel of anything when you very act the whole amp if you take like a, let's take a you know whatever uh take a, I don't know, a fender deluxe and you just very act the whole thing Honestly, they kind of, if you vary them too much, they get kind of skinny. They kind of suck, to be honest with you. It's okay. weird, like, you know, because what happens is now the preamps are getting weak, and then it just gets that real mosquito-y type sound up top. So yeah. it's it's weird. Like, I always thought that, you know, once, obviously, once word gets, you know, did get, got out that that was how you got it, and we heard this, this mammoth sound, you were like, wow, okay, it's got to be, I didn't realize that. I was already kind of doing it in a weird way, but but I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't figure out, like, how to do it with the whole amp because it never worked. I didn't understand the chain. I didn't realize there was a, a load box and all this other stuff that was 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 into it. And so the crazy part was that what I, which is interesting because somebody asked me this the other day. They said I used to come see you play and you always had two Marshalls. And I'm like, yeah, it really wasn't two Marshalls. It was really just one Marshall with two amps. So what I used to do is, uh, and this just comes back to, and you can do this now. You can't do it because, like for example. They were old amps. Now everything's, you know, everything is, everything's an iPhone. You know what I mean? So the second you do, you veer from the norm and you, you, you blow it out. But back in the day, um, what I used to do is I, I, I had access. The only Marshalls I could get my hands on were either JCM 800s, which sounded really classy. Like mm-hmm. they didn't have enough gain. Like they had enough to do like cool rhythm stuff, but I couldn't solo on them. It was just always shy of like getting like, a, you know, I, if, you, if you were nervous and you'd like clam up, you know, it would, it would just fall apart. So I was always like just short. Like the game went to 10, but it needed to go to like 15 on those things. Sure. Like, you know, to, you know mm-hmm. it was like oh, so close. And they were always really harsh sound. It was really glassy. I, I never liked I never liked that brighter sound. So uh, so I either had access to those or because we just, you know, we didn't have, we just had no money. So, or, or we would get used marshals, you know. And so plexis weren't what they were. Uh, you could just get them. Everybody wanted the plexis at the time because we wanted them because of the Almond Brothers. They had this sweeter sound, whereas the metal faces with those goofy bright caps were always so harsh, you know, like the second you turn down to like, you know, had I only known, had anyone told me, you know, that it was the bright cap that was taking me out of the game, you know, cause on the volume, you put the volume on three, you know, but yet you got all the bright cap that's rolling off all your bottom end. Those things, ah, oh, those things should be illegal, you know? <laughs> so, so, but what we figured out was my dad, once again, he was like, well, listen, you know, we got so tired of, uh, we were kind of held hostage by like the, 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 the repair guys because like we could only afford the old stuff, which now is coveted at the time you didn't want. You would gladly, gladly trade a Marshall Plexi for a Saldano any day of the week. You couldn't even get Saldanos, you know what I mean? So I had the you know crappy old Plexi. No one wanted that thing, you know. So um, or I had even worse a metal face. So but what we used to do was uh, my dad kind of got to the point where he was so tight, like they were helped. They had a little bit more, it was like a doctor that had a little bit more knowledge than you. And so you're going, Hey, listen, you know, I need my amp bias. They'd be like, at least where we were, you know, what's Connecticut. They were like, well, I'll tell you what, if you leave it, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'll get it back to you. And we come back two weeks later, keep in mind, it's the only amp I got, you know, it's not, I don't have any, this is all I own is that amp, you know? And so meanwhile, I'm sitting there, you know, nothing. playing unplugged for two weeks and I'd come back and, Two weeks later, and there's more stuff piled around. The guy didn't even get to it. To buy us an amp. I mean, how hard is it to turn a trim pot? You know, but I didn't know. You know what I mean? So I was held hostage. And my dad just walked in. And he says, "We're done with this." He says, "I'll figure it out." So cut to. <laughs> there's my dad on the table with the kitchen knife and the sparks flying. Whoa, whoa, whoa! And he's you know getting jolted. And okay, I guess we don't touch that. And so it was. I mean, it's kind of funny. 
now, but maybe not so funny at the time. And, you know, but my point is we figured out really early on that what, what he did is, and the old marshals, those four inputs, what you could do is if you took the, I, and I, I, I'm not a, I'm not totally accurate as on this, and I highly recommend you do not do this. So if anybody's listening, I go on record as saying do not do this. But what we did <laughs> was we take the center center tap off of the, the treble pot, and that was kind of like the break point of those old amps. And so that was basically you could either feed right into the power section or you could feed into the preamp section. And so what we would do is if you fed into the power section, the only knobs that worked were the volume and the presence. And then if you fed into the other way, then the only thing that worked are the preamp knobs. So we came up with this genius idea. We're like, well, hey, listen, I took a Variac and, and I, we turned the whole thing down. It just sounded really thin. It didn't sound, it didn't sound healthy at all. It didn't really tighten the bottom up, it ended up or anything. So we figured out what we'll do is we'll use one amp as the preamp and the other amp as the power section. So I would take the power tubes out of one amp, you know, and only kept the preamp tubes. I think the phase inverter, I think you had to keep it. Uh, I don't remember because... And like I said, you don't want to do this. There's like so much voltage in those things, you will die. Mm -hmm. So high recommend, do not do this. But anyways, we did it. And uh, so I basically would run one amp as the preamp, one amp as the power section, and I would just turn down the voltage on the power section. That was kind of like the closest to a power soak I could come up with at the time. It was still super loud, but the preamp was always real strong. So in short, whenever you'd see me play those old gigs and I had the two marshals, it was really just one marshal. I never had a backup. I couldn't afford a backup, you know? So that was it. And then, uh, I think I blew that one up <laughs> at one point. And so my dad said, all right, well, we'll just make you an amp. And so that's how that original dirty boy came about. That's why it's got that big knob in the front. And so the whole point of that amp that weighs like literally, I think it's like 80 something pounds. It's really heavy. It's like an SVT. It's really big. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what was cool about it is that it only, that's why it's got, it's got like seven or eight transformers and I don't know what he's got in there, but he basically built it so that the preamp section is real strong and healthy and the power amp is the one that sags. And that's, I just kind of got that from, but my point of the whole thing is you would never do that today with an iPhone. You know what I mean? Like you wouldn't do that today with a modeling this or a this, you know? So it was kind of outlaw at the time. You could get away with whatever, which was great. And it allowed me to do things that other people weren't doing, but it was a product of the times. And I think stuff like that, uh, will is is going by the wayside. It just makes it becomes the lost craft. So I agree, and I think there is somebody in the chat. We're going to get to it in a second here that might have asked about the amp that your dad built you, uh, built with you. So let's jump over the chat for a quick second. We'll come back into some Van Halen questions here in a second as well too. We'll say hi to a bunch of people, and there's probably some questions too. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. We're having a great time so far. Quentin James is here. Uh, Guitar Wayno's here. Carl Santin. Uh, hey guys, happy Friday. Lau Ketchum, Scott McCarthy. Our MacArthur, sorry, Jamie, the the law is here. Cold Gen fifty one fifty, the the man blues. Um, uh, Scott MacArthur says I saw blues at a guitar clinic at Soundpost in Lagrange, uh, Illinois, um, Burbank, Chicago, back in ninety one or so uh, when the Plaid album came out. Uh, so much fun. He was like nineteen then and a smoking player. So very cool. Blast from the past. Nice. Take it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eric Harbauer is here. Says, hey, guys. And Eric, I hope I pronounced your, your last name, Har Harbauer. Um, uh, he's here. Says, hi, guys. Scott MacArthur Blues. Are you still playing the amp that your dad made? So there you, are you still playing it today, or do you have a uh, piece of a kick around? I, I, now everything is moved on. I do. Ha I have the original one. I, I, it's, it's like it's become folklore at this point. And everybody <laughs> tries to – had more people try to buy that thing off him. I'm just sitting on it. You know what I mean? Uh, I do have it, and I, I did use it. As a matter of fact, I just did a project called The Biggest Band in the World, mm -hmm. uh, which is – whole tv and film it's kind of like the side project we have with all the guys from extreme music and what's happening is because i'm just doing all tv and film now and i know sooner or later somebody's gonna say hey man how about another instrumental record that always comes up but yeah. to answer your question i do have it and yes i do play it i don't play it as much as i used to because it's a very particular thing it's mm -hmm. kind of like you know it, it's just it's 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 just it's it's the uber one trick pony if i guess if that makes sense to be honest with you and a lot of people aren't really I think people have that amp wrong. I don't think they get what it is. It's really kind of, it's, it's like if a Marshall in a box had a baby, it's basically kind of that deal. It's a real particular, it's very easy to play. So, uh, it's super easy. There's a ton of gain to it in a weird way, but it's, it's not like thin preamp gain. It's like power section. So it's, and there's actually like a booster section in it and it's got all these, it's got two channels, but I, I never, ever, one of them was supposed to be like this kind of Marshall channel. It just it wasn't, and it didn't work. So, uh, so I never used that one. I only used, I actually used the clean side with the boost on it. And the crazy thing with that one is my dad actually also worked it out because we, we got so used to the old days with the power section. So what I used to do is I used to just take like, you know, 
because I ended up blowing up one of those marshals because, you know, why wouldn't I? And then I had the money to fix it. So I think I, I traded it for like, I don't remember what I traded it for. But anyways, uh, you know, and I'm sure it was a simple fix. I think I cooked out. I don't know what I cooked on it. But anyways, so I kept the power section one and I used to just run other amps into it. And so I would do the same thing with, with my the amp my dad built. I would use other preamps to get different sounds, you know, because the power section was really kind of the, the, the telltale sound of that thing. And um, it's kind of weird. It's kind of a boxier, scratchier. Uh, it's kind of a harsher sound, but it always cuts. It's really particular. You'll always know when you hear it. Um, but I do have it. I do keep it. I mean, I've got a lot of different amps. The crazy stuff is today, these days, like, I, like we said earlier, um, sometimes I'm using like guitar rig. It's weird. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not precious about things. Uh, plus, for my particular style, it's like I'm not, I've never been a jack of all trades type of guy. I'm, I, you know, it's either you like what I do or you don't. It's a very particular skill set. Uh, so because of that, it doesn't really, honestly, it's whatever I do, I ended up bending it to what I need it to do anyway. So whether yeah. it's a, you know, an old tweed basement or, or, or a new, you know, diesel, it doesn't matter. I, I'll use all that stuff. I like it all. I make mm-hmm. it all work. It doesn't matter. I just use them. I just kind of find the sweet spot in whatever it is. And I just play to that. I, I make that. I find a way to make it work to my strengths, and that's the deal. It's just finding the sweet spot in whatever it is, whether it's a Fender Champ. I'll, I'll make that work, you know. And then exactly, great answer. Know, yeah, that, that was a deal. That's perfect. Well, it's good to know that you still have it for sure, and it's something that was a, a huge part of your uh, your uh, growing up, uh, you know, as a musician. So fantastic. And Mike yeah. Francis is here saying, "Hey guys." Thomas Santiago says, "Hey Eric," and everyone in the chat. Um, and Patrick Kish says, uh, good question. Scott MacArthur would love to hear about how the relationship with his dad enriched uh, his tone playing and generally influenced him as an artist. That's awesome. It's very cool. It really warms my heart too, because with my boy here, um, I'm very protective of him and his music, uh, what he will maybe become a career. And it's nice to see, um, you know, father and son doing that. It's great. Um, let me see Don Shepard's here saying, Hey again, all, cause I was live just a little while ago. Uh, Patrick Kish says, hey, Don, it's Friday night blues party. It is a blue. I like that. It's blues party tonight. It's great. Yeah. Uh, Cody Birkenstock says, hey, what's up, blues? And what's up, Eric? Carlos Santon, um, uh, this is cool. Yeah, he says, EVH takes the same approach. If it sounds good, it's good. How do you how you use the 12 notes is up to you. Uh, and Cole Jin, 5150 says, New Haven, Connecticut, where you are talking about New Haven uh-huh. earlier, which is great. Thanks to the uh, Live Without a Net. Uh, Warren Hughes, Guitar Shredder, uh, says, uh, hey, guys, what's up? Don Shepard, it is Patrick Scott MacArthur. I remember the blues Yamaha guitars back in the day. And that's, I'm really glad you mentioned Rich Lasner because Rich had just, when you had mentioned he jumped over to um, to Yamaha, I have one of the first Pacificas that he put out. I have it back here. I won it in the Guitar Wars. It's the 921. It's got the nice cutaway he was famous for. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, that, was his, that was his baby. Love that guitar to death. And I, I need to start playing it more. All DiMarzio's humbuckers, a stacked single core humbucker, humbucker. Um, the only thing I didn't like about it, and I'll, I'll tell you about it, is the Floyd Rose, the license with the Yamaha Floyd. And um, it was okay. You still put the strings, it's not like a Floyd Rose too, but you put the strings through the bottom of the trim, um, oh. and, and you, uh, you could technically cut the balls off, I guess. But the, the locking nut was not a three millimeter locking nut. It was like a five or something, a very non-traditional locking nut. And you can imagine what that's like. You're at a gig. Hey, do you got a 5.5 yeah. millimeter wrench on you? You know? That's- Yes, so, so that's yeah, the only thing yeah. I didn't like. But jumbo frets, the war, I think it was a Warmoth neck on it. Um, yeah. So that's a killer guitar. So nice uh, talking about uh, Rich Lasner. And as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, I lit up because I love that name. Uh, yeah. Paul Glover says, I love those uh, plaid Yamahas. Uh, RGZ model, I think, Scott saying. Uh, Paul Glover saying, hey, Eric and Blues. Uh, yeah, Pacifica guitars. Um, and that's why I'm really liking kind of some of the things that are coming out with Line 6 right now with, the, you know, with them being uh, uh, together. Some of the guitars are getting some real nice flavor because of Yamaha's, uh, you know, influence as well, too. Uh, Gary Davlin's here saying good evening. Um, let me see here. Scott McCarthy, Yamaha makes fantastic stuff. No doubt about it. He says his first tube amp was Yamaha T1000. I remember that. Uh, Mike Soldano yeah, designed. Those. Yeah. Those... I, I couldn't get anything out of that. That thing just sounded, I don't know what it was. I, I could, It didn't work for me, but then somebody did a, I, I hear you can take them and mod them and they're basically salt anos is the deal you know what i mean so that's kind of the you know but it's amazing i, I have friends of mine that they make stuff you look at it and be like how does that even work and they make it sound great so yeah it really works i'm very uh well we're very far behind on the chat but uh futone adam reaver do you know are you friends with adam do you know adam at fu tone adam, adam reaver at fu tone i i think you're, you're not much of a floyd guy anymore right like uh you, you're not as much as I, it's not that I'm not. I, it's, it's funny. I'm not at this moment, but I'm actually. 
I actually do have a Floyd on one of uh, Ernie Ball sent me this Axis thing, mm-hmm. and uh, it's got a Floyd. I actually, it's weird. I actually am a Floyd player. I just, it's, I, you just, I guess I, the best way I can explain it is I just, I'm, I, you just ebb and flow. At the moment, I'm a hardtail guy, mm-hmm. but I actually miss not having a floating Floyd. I, I have, I have some floating tremolos, but nothing. I actually need to get a, a, a Floyd because you're the master of the trem for a while. Things. Say what now? You, you were the master of the trem for a while, man. I mean, seriously. Yeah, I just live on. I, I remember I, it was it was me and and, and Daryl Abbott, man. We were like we used to we used to laugh our ass off because like you know <laughs> he'd same thing. We'd float them and you 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 bend your style to it because when you bend the notes all drop flat, so you end up overbending everything. It becomes a thing. I I loved it. They they were great. They were they were hard to you know you had to make sure they were set up right. But I loved it for years. I was just I lived with those things. And then one day. And, and I'm like that. Like, like I'll give you a perfect example. When I bought my first house, I took every guitar I owned and I sold them to the Hard Rock Cafe. I kept one to do a session. And I had a friend of mine that uh, uh, he lived right down the street, and he had a you know, he had like a hundred guitars. And so I used to have to keep going to him, <laughs> to saying, some. "Hey, borrow a guitar. I got a session tomorrow. I need a Les Paul." And he's like, "Yeah, take it. He was so cool." And uh, uh, yeah, so and I, because at the time there, you know, guitar was hot, and there was a lady there that had bought them all, and so that was a big part. But I'm not precious about that stuff. Like, mm-hmm. um, to me, they're just they're forks and knives. You know what I mean? I just go with whatever's great, and I'm good with it. I make it all work. It doesn't. I don't. I'm. That being said, I'm very particular about them, but I'm not precious about it. Yeah. Like I, you know, the size of my hands, man. You know, so I need a bigger neck. Small necks, I can't use them. Yeah. Just can't. Give me a 19. Your typical 1960 flat neck, I, I, I give it back to you because I can't make it. My hands just lock up. Um, and, I, and for some reason, I, it's always my left hand that's, you know, so I always need the, 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 the bigger stuff. But as long as it's got a big neck and decent frets on it, I, I'll get you there. I'm not really worried about yeah. it a ton. I set my stuff up all, you know, even my amps, I set them up all pretty pretty much the same way. Like, I don't think I've ever turned the treble on on any of my amps, ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just don't turn it I don't like that sound. I don't like that brightness. I, you know, maybe clean. I, I shouldn't say never. Uh, yeah. Because in all honesty, the real truth is that as an artist, you you change. So what I'm doing Tuesday for to get that sound it may be totally different. So I guess I guess what I'm saying is typically I don't I don't have like I, I'm not like your guy that sets the treble. I I turn that shit off. I don't like it. <laughs> well, you know how we you know? we all come full circle. And if if you come back around and and the Floyd Rose is calling your name again, whether it be on the Ernie Ball or whatever it may be. Just trust me on this. I want you to do me a favor. When you pick up the guitar and maybe it's going to be used for a couple of projects and you got a Floyd, let me know you got a project coming up and you're doing something with the Floyd. And I want to give you Adam's name and number and he will be happy to hear from you. And you'll be you'll be very happy to hear from him. He is basically he will become your best friend. Anyone that has a Floyd and he does stuff with acoustic guitars as well, too. But he turns a Floyd Rose into the world's hottest hottest piece it's a bit more important to you than your guitar at that point but just call me at some time when if you ever start using floyds i think somebody told me i think i was talking to i forget who who it was it was one of one of the famous guitar players we're not going to name he works with all of them so he works with all of them is he the guy who puts the bigger blocks on and all that stuff and gets them because my biggest problem with the the floyds like the whole reason like for example i have my own seymour duncan i've had my own model pickup forever and that whole fight was just I love the the Floyds because they what you could do I mean, they're untouchable what those things can do. Mm-hmm. The problem is, man, they just gut the guitar sonically so bad that you're always fighting to try and get as much of that back, you know. And yep. so my biggest problem was just a sonics issue with them long term. You know, Tell, I'm mean? telling you, I turn you on to Adam, and I'm going to be on your Christmas list. You're going to be sending me Christmas greeting cards. You're going to love me that much. Trust me. All so, right, okay, I'm, I'm going to share you his information. All right. well, let's do it. You know what I mean? I'm All right. ready. There you go, Adam. Yeah. Watch for an email from 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 Blues. <laughs> I'm, I'm easy to find. All you know? right. So, but yeah, it's just interesting. So, uh, yeah, the gear thing and how things have changed so much. And, I know. and now with, I'm doing all TV and film stuff and I've been doing it forever. And that's the crazy part. The crazy part is I guarantee you, if you're watching TV of any kind, whether you're Netflixing or any stuff, you're hearing my stuff, you don't even realize it. It's ridiculous. And it's so funny because, you know, when I was in the magazines, you think, well, you have, you know, you have this kind of influence. I actually, I'm reaching out to worldwide now more so than ever. So it's funny that now I'm even technically more behind the scenes, yet I feel my influence is out there considerably mm-hmm. more than it ever was, which is weird. I know? want to but, talk about that for a second. I'm going to pause for a second. So I said hi to Adam there. I'm going to come to your question in a second, Carl Santon. Um, I was listening to something on YouTube today because come show day, 
I like to really get in the mindset of the guest. And, and, and today it's you. And I'm surrounding myself with music. I'm going over last minute questions for you, making sure everything's good, crossing all the T's, dotting the I's. And I'm listening to music of you uh, to get in the mood. And okay, is it Dark Country or something? The movie you did, you, you, was it that movie you did some work in? No, well, the Dark Country is the series. Okay. The series. So, but in, like, what happens is that, so, so the brief overview is basically this. I got about 15 years ago, uh, my friend uh, Dweezel had an opportunity to work with this company called Extreme Music because they mm-hmm. wanted to license some of his dad's material. And at the time, the mom was like, no, we're not going to do that. But they went and said, hey, Dweezel, we, you, know, we, you as an artist, we would like to have stuff from you because they really respected him mm-hmm. you know, as, as, on, as a standalone artist. And so they basically gave him a project. And I think it was 10 songs of like skate rock or just like really, like really, you know, really guitar oriented stuff. And they're like, we got this guy. We're going to bring in Dweezel. He's going to be amazing. You know, because he will be. He, he's going to crush it, you know? Of course. So he, at the time, was, he's just, you know, he, I think this was right, he was kind of looking to do more. He kind of was really wanting to get into like, kind of keeping his dad's legacy out there. I, he really felt that calling. And he basically went up and says, listen, man, 10 songs is a lot. I got a buddy of mine. I think he's a great fit for this. Do you mind if I bring him in on it? They said, well, listen, it's on you. If you bring in the guy and he's good, then fine. So he calls me up and says, hey, want to come do this? We'll work on it together. And we were so hyped. I was like, yeah, we get a chance to kind of collaborate. We had never really collaborated on a project. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we were going to basically do that. And then they had all these deadlines and he was uh, working on all the touring stuff. He literally took a year and decided to like retrain himself guitar. That's a crazy, you, you should get him. <laughs> on your, hey, on your, on your let me, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to tell you something really funny. I was just checking. I texted him just before the show, and I said, dude, because I've been, I've been trying to get him on the show for a long time. Um, I said, your buddy's going to be on the show in 15 minutes. You've got to get your butt on this show. So tell him after. Tell him how much fun it is. I feel, yeah, he is. I mean, he is the Van Halen. I mean, that guy, he's got it. Oh, I know. Such, I mean, it's it's freakish. And he, his ability to play that stuff is crazy pants, you know. Yeah. But. Anyway, so he basically, for whatever reason, he got busy. And so we ended up having to kind of divide and conquer. So I kind of took like half the load. He took half the workload and I handed mine in. And one of them we actually worked on together, We but we still did it like in pieces. And so the long and short of it was I handed my stuff in, he handed his stuff in, and they loved it. They were like, this is exactly what we need. They went back to him and said, hey, we want more. And he's like, well, I'm going to kind of do this tour. He says, you, you know, and they said, well, can we work with him? And, and, and I went to him and said, hey, you know, do you mind if I do this? He's like, no, it's cool. I don't, have, I don't have time to do this anyway. So he was like just cherry picking what he wanted to do. And so the long and short of it was I kind of got in with this company called Extreme Music uh, about 15, 16, maybe 17 years ago. And as they grew, they became the – they are the top of the food chain as far as production music goes. And they grew. They got bought out by Viacom. Then they got bought out by Sony. Now it's so it's huge. So what happens is this. We started creating kind of these subgenres. So the dark country that you're referring to was basically stuff gets licensed for TV, meaning you don't want the cheap stuff. You don't want that knockoff stuff mm-hmm. because there's no shelf life to it. There's just too many people doing it. But what happens is that I sat down with Extreme. We all basically came up with the conclusion. Listen, we're going to make, you know, we want to make like you want Van Halen tracks. I want that. I want the track. What's, what's there, 10 tracks on Van Halen 1? I'm pretty sure it's 10 mm-hmm. or 11, something like that. Yep. I want tracks 11 through 20 that, you know, that you've just discovered under your bed that are no one's ever heard before. That's kind of always the goal to do it. So we started kind of making these genres like Dark Country, which is like that Johnny Cash. And so the crazy thing is like they get picked up on all these shows. And like, for example, like somebody just took a video. They took one of the songs, a song, like I think it's called Dogs of War. Yeah, they put it, they just put some like homemade video. They put it on YouTube, and it's got like over eleven million views. You know, that's what so, I was listening to today. Beautiful and dark, and it's like someone said it should be in that Red Dead Redemption, Red Dead Redemption use, video game. They use it for all the trailers and the games and all the video games. It gets used for wrestlers are using it. There's a song called Evil Ways that Undertaker. It, it, it's, yeah, yeah, all they all use it gets used everywhere, and I, you know, which is so. So the funny part is, is that. You know, it, it's international. It's used in, you know, in Bali. It's used in Nova Scotia. It's used in, you know. And so the reality is it became for me because there was just nowhere for me to go. I'm not, in my DNA, I'm not like a Steve Vai who, like, he is a, he is truly a student of guitar. Van Halen is a guy. That's, that's, that's their calling. To me, I was more of an overview guy. So I didn't, I had to kind of make a call. I had done these records. Mm-hmm. I had this really. And I was totally grateful to have such a strong, legit. That's one thing I will say about my fan base that I've always truly appreciated more than anything else was that I kind of felt like the people that really backed me 
truly got it. Like I've got the same fans I've had for the last 20, 30 years. I was always very appreciative of that because sometimes part of being popular is, you know, if you truly want to be popular, you're not popular with your peers or the people that you respect. You're popular with everybody. Everybody that walked, the first 10 people that walked through Walmart, that's your crew. You know what I mean? Well, I always kind of really respected my people that were, you know, people that, that's why, that's, who, you know, like I'll give you an example. I joined Poison, right? Because it was an opportunity to play stadiums. Mm-hmm. And it was a great opportunity. I was grateful to have it, to be honest with you. They were nice guys. And it was, I, I have nothing but really great things to say other than the times, you know, grunge kicked in and pff, that yeah. was it. You Killed know what it. I mean? But it was, it was a great learning experience. But the only part that I was disheartened with, which had nothing to do with anything other than the reality of life, was that I truly learn what it's like to be famous, meaning famous when you're in a different country and people are crying and they want you to sign their arms so they can tattoo it 20 minutes later. <laughs> you know, the reality is you're, I was, I was liked and adorned because I was in the spot. They, they weren't, these weren't my peers. They didn't get, get it. Now I wasn't mad at them. They were nice people, very sweet people, but it wasn't, it left me, I got to see on that side of the curtain. I want I realized I want to be famous to the people that I, that I care about. Somebody that I want to stop and have a conversation with and say, Oh, you know, Hey, let's have a conversation. I respect you. You like Van Halen. I like Van Halen. Cool. We got something to talk about. I don't have anything in common with these other people. I really don't. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to be there. And so that was a, that's kind of one of the many things I took out of that experience. I was grateful for it. And, and, um, and it was what it was. Uh, but, that was the interesting part about life. So sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old cliche is, is very, very true. Um, here's yeah. here's that question from Carlo from Canada here, a friend of mine. He says, uh, Blues, how did you put it all together without being a theory student? I can move my fingers, but I'm weak with theory, and I don't know how to put it together uh, into something good. Now, uh, let me just interject something quickly. Um, I know you're going to give a much better answer on this. I look at it as a roadmap. You know, back in the day, a lot of these kids don't know what a roadmap is. Now it's Google and, you know, and Apple apps and stuff like that, or Apple Maps. But, you know, the old days, we used to have to look at maps. I, I would get so lost trying to read a map, and I look at sometimes theory, and I know this is not the right answer, but I look at theory sometimes as a roadmap of telling you how to get from A to B, and I'm still going to get lost. But tell us how you could expand on that. Uh, sadly, I can't. I mean, uh, all I can honestly tell you, like, and this, and I realize it's kind of a weird question. You're going to walk out of here like that was absolutely. I felt that was of no help. But honestly, here's the bottom line: if it sounds good, it's good. I mean, that's really it. To be totally honest with you, and uh, it, 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 that's it's no more. Cut. There's always some basic rules. I mean, hey, tune your guitar. You know, it helps. Yep. You know, yep. you, you want to play. But sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes you're playing single note things and they're a little pitchy. Sometimes it's cool, to be honest with you. I mean, sometimes when you perfect things, it's weird. It's like it doesn't work. And so the only thing I can tell you, I can only give you a much broader based answer, which is probably not of a huge help, is like, you know, as much as I think that, you know, I, I think I think if you're truly talented, I think you can kind of get it there more than not. But there's going to be some times where you just, it's not going to happen. I think you, have, you almost have to respect that. Like on some level, it's like, like I'll give you an example. How many people have written one great tune and they can't write another for their life to depend on. It's not like they don't want to write a hit. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to write a hit. We all wake up going, man, I want to buy that house in the Hamptons. Let me write this hit. I want my kids to get braces this week. Let's, everybody wants to, it's just, they just can't, you know? I mean, in all fairness, why do you think artists that have their early records that are amazing and then they have their later records and they kind of suck, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because they just can't, you know what I mean? It's a certain moment in time. It is what it is. You know what I mean? So to be honest with you, it's almost like you just have to respect the fact that, you know, sometimes it's going to be great and sometimes it's not, you know, and I, and some artists, just guys like David Bowie, who I really feel is like a true artist. He's always came up with something great. He did like, you know, Ziggy Stardust and then he did Let's Dance. I love Let's Dance. You mm-hmm. know, I like, I, I like Ziggy Stardust. Two completely like, different, but it know, then he did some, Yeah. Then he did some other stuff where it's like computer noises. And I'm like, this sucks. I don't like this. You know what I mean? Yep. But you know, there, that's part of being an artist. And so, so I, to, to answer your question, I think you just have to kind of go with what works. I mean, you know, and, and honestly, a lot of times you just you start with one thing and it kind of leads you to the next thing. I can't always tell you, you know, I can't tell you the, I can't guarantee you the end result other than it will be something special. And I think if you're truly an artist, which I like to think that I am on some level, is that I'll get you something out of something. You hand me anything, I'll get you something. Mm-hmm. It may not be ordered, but it'll be cool. And I think if you really like an artist, then you know. You know, like I like I like Ed when he was doing his early stuff, and I like when he was tapping on the guitar. The piano it was all cool stuff. I like some stuff better than the other, but at least, at least he, you know, 
he was doing his thing. I, I like it. I was sold. So it didn't really matter. And I like to think that I strive to do the, the same thing in my own way. I mean, yeah. So. Just just keep playing. And Carlo, I've seen you play. Uh, I've seen him play before and he's got talent. Uh, just, <laughs> just don't just don't stop. Just don't stop. And you're going to have I, I like to say uh, I have more bad days and good days as a player. But that makes me respect the good days r- r- greatly. When I have a good day, I'm like, yes. So, Carl, look at it this way. Uh, look at it like playing a game of golf. Don't go out on the first day trying to shoot par. Um, you know, shoot five over uh, on a on a on a hole. Shoot whatever you can, and just maybe one day in your life you hit a par. Maybe you hit an eagle one day, but just go and have fun with it each time. Yeah, and I, I think like I, you also have to decide kind of what you're about. Like for me. It's just kind of my personality. Like this is basically me in, in a nutshell. Like I leave Connecticut, I move to Los Angeles. I want to compete. If we're going to compete, let's just go to the Olympics already. I don't yeah. want like like, and I'm kind of like that with everything. Like either I want something that's amazing, like I'm talking like wow, or I want something that's awful. Where I, I just don't want to live. I guess in the middle. Mm-hmm. You know, at least at least when it comes to the art. Maybe maybe in life that's not the best uh, right, right. scenario. Like maybe you have to be a little more even. But but for me. I kind of felt like at least I swung for the fences, you know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you hit and sometimes it, you know, it doesn't work, but at least I went for it. I mean, I, that's why I ran two amps together, voltage up, voltage down. You know, were you supposed to do that? Nope. You know I mean? I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. I don't recommend it, but I did it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was kind of like, so at least I, I, you know, and I do that now to this day. I won't even, even when I'm working on the TV stuff, I'm still, I'm just swinging for the fences 24 seven. Taking a chance. Taking a chance. Because you know, someone's going to get there sooner and that's the plan. Mm-hmm. Here in Canada, I say throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. You know, the bunch of this, if I pulled my stove apart, there's probably about nine pounds of spaghetti on the floor behind the stove. But I throw a bunch of stuff at the wall, the virtual so, wall. All I'm going to say is you'd be shocked. I mean, like, you know, because as you, you know, as you build a career and you start, I mean, you, you know, at some point you realize all these famous people are now your peers and you have to kind of, it's weird. And then you start seeing how they do it and you realize, whoa, they're totally faking it. You know what I mean? Like, I can't tell you. How many scenarios I've been, I've walked out of there completely disheartened, like, jeez, I thought that this guy had a lock. He's, he is swinging at best trying to figure it out, you know, and it's, it's amazing. Or, or how many heroes you're going to meet, uh, and it's not any one person, just in general. You're going to meet people that are just have it so together, one part of their talent, and mm-hmm. then so not together as people. It's painful. You know yes. what I mean? And you will walk out of there like, you know, it's, it's almost hard to stomach. And that's why they say don't meet the heroes. You I know. know. It's kind of like, I know. You know. And speaking of it's heroes. About- yeah, I, I know. I hear you. And speaking of heroes, we're going to talk about a lot of our heroes over here. And actually, this is a perfect, perfect segue too. Darren Moore, uh, uh, rock and roll. My good buddy, Darren, he's a huge David Lee Roth fan. And I know you've got a cool David Lee Roth story for us come up. In a minute. <laughs> so let's get into that in a second. We're about uh, 10, 20. We're going to wrap it up close to around the 1030 time here. Um, but I'm going to go back to a bunch of other uh, comments real quick. Uh, FNAF Gamers is here. Saying finally here. Quentin James says, Lucy, he loves your stories. Uh, Don Shepard needs some food, food tone. Um, uh, Colgen 5150 is asking, uh, blues, he says, how did, uh, how did you come about the Albert Lee music man? The, uh, the gold, uh, that gold sparkle one. That's very nice. And he loves your playing. So how did that one kind of, uh, fall into your hands? Uh, the gold, okay. The gold. So here's the long story short. The yeah. gold one was this, I already had two different, uh, models. I had a Yamaha plaid guitar, I had Samick plaid guitars. I had I'd kind of done it. I was kind of just kind of over it. Didn't really know what I wanted to do next. I had already done the guitar thing. I just, it was really it felt, in all honesty, like when you sit down on a movie and you already know the ending. I was like, I don't even want to be at this movie anymore. It's like I just knew how it was going to end. I couldn't. I don't have that hoarder mentality. It's like you know, just one good one's good enough for me. You know, and it, not that, not that there's anything wrong with it. I'm not judging. I'm just saying it just wasn't for me. So, anyways, once again, the only person I knew when I moved out to Los Angeles was Weasel. Mm-hmm. So I would come out, and he lived like you know, right down this the street. And so I would just hang out over his place because he had cookies and ice cream at his place. <laughs> there, was, there was always food over there. And so I was living with my girlfriend at the time. And so we would just end up hanging out. And so anyways, I had been friends with him for years. We, you know, still to this day, we're, you know, we've always gotten along. And so he was friends with Sterling Ball and he would take, he would go golfing with Sterling. And I, he took me to the this posh country club and I had all the crazy hair at the time. And I, and he's like, I, don't, you know, I, I just, I remember taking like a, a, a a tube sock and wrapping it in my hair because I, I didn't want to be totally embarrassing. So I, I'm walking around with a tube sock in my hair and I got introduced to Sterling Ball and he was just the nicest guy and we got along really well. And so anyways, he was always giving me a hard time about, you know, hey, when are you going to, when are you going to get real and start playing Ernie Ball? And I was like, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure it out. But he was never, it was never any kind of push. He was always just razzing me, you know. So for, I knew, I knew Sterling for about four or five years. And then finally, I think we were to show and Sterling's like, listen, I'll cut you to the chase. He goes, I will make you whatever you want. The only thing I ask is that if you truly like it, just use it. 
And if you don't, then no harm, no foul. And I said, you know, he says, and I, he says, and I'm not going to make you a guitar model. He says, I already know you've got other guitar models. He says, I'm not doing that, but I'll make you a, I'll make you a stellar guitar if you want one. And I said, you know, that's the most fair thing I've heard in a long time. And so he made me, which is, as a matter of fact, I've got here. I'm going to get it for you. You're going to get to see it. Hold sure. on, hold on. I'll be right back. No problem. It's never. Literally, I had rehearsal last night with it. So this is how honestly crazy. There it is. You're looking at it, you know. I shared and a video so of that today with you at NAMM. NAMM 2016, you were playing that. Yeah, I play. I play, it's 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 my daily driver. And the crazy part is, it's it's just become my go-to guitar to play live. Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of guitars like in the studio for different things. I mean, everything has its. Once again, they're like you know, a Strat is a Strat, a Telly is a Telly. Can you lift but that anyways, one back up again for a second? Just lift it up to show the crowd. Oh sure, yeah. So, so I've always got it. It's always it's always within arm's reach. There you go. That's beautiful. That's a nice guitar. This is the guitar that just came back from England. As a matter of fact, it got lost in England. Our driver left it by the car. Oh no. In this. Yeah, and, and we drove off. They gave us like the super posh car service. It was really nice. We hop in, and the guy's like, you know, takes the guitar. He's like, I'll take care of it for you. I'll be real careful. Of it. I'm like, no problem. And we hop in the car and we drive away, and the guy just spaced out and left it. You know, the nicest guy. But, anyways, another driver, uh, this guy named uh, Nigel Manley, found it. He nice. was laying by his car. It's a long story that we don't have time to get into. But basically, <laughs> the guy did the right thing and he tracked me down via. Andy over at Strings and Things in the UK, and they called the over to the US and they said, "Hey man, did you lend your gold guitar out?" And I'm like, "No, no, I did not. As a matter of fact, I'm missing a gold guitar." And the guy, the police, it's a long involved story. The police showed up, grabbed the guitar from him, and they hand delivered it to me. And I got it the day of the show. No so way. The, right. So basically, this guitar is an Albert Lee. It's got a bigger neck. It's got this. This is the original. One. It's got a, a V neck. It's a big neck. Uh, not super big, but big, bigger than the stock ones for sure. And it's got a maple cap on it to get a little more punch. And so Sterling basically said, listen, if you like it, play it. And I said, okay, that's a fair enough deal. And I've had the guitar for 16 years, I think. Yeah, I think 2001, 16 or 17 years, whatever it's been, 2002, something like that. Yeah. And uh, it's just a good bread and butter guitar for the, for the live stuff. So it gets used. And that's my sterling ball I, was, I think dudley gimple was the guy that made it and another yeah. gentleman did the fret work i just I keep spacing on his name but uh yeah that is the deal that's technically my, right now story. you should not have that guitar because i mean the the, the odds of you getting that back that's sh- i'm surprised that it's not in someone's basement on the wall uh or whatever at a pawn shop you know stories in in england so here's the moral story do not mess around at heathrow man the the uk police are all business it was they were so that somebody literally hand carried it these two police officers spent an hour on the train and hand delivered it to me at the hotel i literally felt like i was the president it was crazy Isn't that something? England, that's pretty cool freedom. that's very yeah. cool i love it's that crazy. yeah so and i and so, yeah it was just and it was just yeah they, this this guy just did the right thing can you imagine in this world I thought for sure I was like that thing is dust, yep, and I was gone. bummed a little bit because I mean it's just a thing. It's not like it's a dog or or a person. I I mean I, so you care about it meaning it's a thing, and of course you'd like to have it back if you know. But it's just you know. Yeah, but, it's an object. But at the same time, it's just it just it's found its way back. So it's just a crazy story, but it is. No, that's a very special yes. story. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing it. I'm glad you got it back too. Um, we're get, we're going to be wrapping up probably in about five to eight minutes. But I want to ask you about the David Lee Ross story. Uh, you told oh, yeah. me, and I don't even know what it is yet. You told me a lot of things off here, which are very cool, and I wish we we could talk about some of them, um, some cool stories. But let's let's get some uh, David Lee Roth uh, gossip right, from so you. My David Lee Roth story. Now keep in mind, I'm you know obviously I'm a big Van Halen guy. Yep. So I run into Rick Rubin uh, uh, and Venice Beach. Uh, yeah, when I'm with my girlfriend at the time, and uh, Rick, uh, Rick was actually he's always been really cool. He kind of has been aware of my playing, and would keep like trying to get me gigs, like with the Chili Peppers or this that. He's always trying to like you know find a good marriage there. And so he says, "Hey man, you know David Lee Roth is looking for a player. You'd be a great fit." And so, anyways, I get my uh, he gives my number to David Lee Roth, and I think David Lee Roth didn't at the time he was trying to do this crazy blues record. Like you know, remember he had that like phase, mm-hmm. and so he thought. I'm going to get this guy named Blues to do a blues record. That'll be hilarious. So I'm living with my girlfriend at the time in Connecticut, and I'm staying at her house. This is before I moved in. And literally, I was about to move out in Connecticut, and I'm staying at her house. And this house is literally like, it's like, it's got the little tchotchkes and the doilies. I'm staying in the guest. Her parents were so cool. They let me stay in the guest room. But like, it was so knickknacked out that I would just lay in bed like a vampire. <laughs> like I didn't want to mess the bed up, you know? So I'm laying in bed. 
and anyways, I, so that's, that's the, the backstory. Like there's doilies everywhere and like, you know, this home is our house or whatever. It was just, it was so not my thing. It was, but, but they were so nice to me and they let me stay there. So anyways, I'm standing there and I come home and she's like, oh, I've got a phone message for you. And she goes, a Mr. Roth called. I'm like, Mr. Roth? It's like an attorney goes, or? Yeah. She goes, a Mr. David Roth called you. Call him back. And I go, well, what? She goes, yeah. Oh, and she goes, she reads it. She goes, oh, it's in regards to fame and fortune. Oh, my God. And I call up, and sure enough, there's David Lee Roth on the other line. I'm just like, what is going on, you know? So anyways, I fly out to California. I My mom had a brand-new Mazda Miata, so I drive down to Pasadena. I'm in the Mazda Miata, because why wouldn't I be? And it's it, he was living at the, the, the Pasadena house, which is, you know, his dad's old house. So I pull in, and boom, with the Mazda Miata, of course. I park the car, you know, and his assistant comes out and says, you know, Dave's down by the pool. And so I go down. By the pool, and it's like, I mean, the place is colossal, man. It's like yeah. a compound. You're like, what? I mean, it's got this big, it's like Scarface style, like these big, I mean, the walls are 15 feet tall. And I'm like, this is out of the movies, and I'm still, anyways, I go down there, and sure enough, there's David Lee Roth in a tracksuit by the pool, and I'm just like, this is insane, you know? And I really wanted to do the job. But anyway, so I'll sum it up, because I know we're, sh- we're short on time. Uh, so basically, it was a three-hour meeting with David Lee Roth. And so the first hour, and I kid you not, it was the funniest hour I've spent on this planet. My sides hurt, hurt from the stories. He was he was on fire. It was like Dave Chappelle and Eddie Murphy had a baby, and it was David Lee Roth. Wow. You know, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, it, it, it. I literally had to take a minute to try and breathe. He was so funny. Then the second hour kicks in, and I was kind of like, "Wow, that's funny," but I kind of think I thought I heard that joke oh. before. And then the third hour was like. Oh my God, I'm being held hostage by David Roth. <laughs> right? And so anyway, so I kind of like got out of that scenario pretty good. And then I did not end up getting the job. I ended up taking tapes. I sent them in. And I just don't think he liked, I, I don't think I was that far along as far as, so yeah. in all fairness, I did not turn him down. He didn't, I, he turned me down. That is the truth. But, uh, and he was an actually an exceptionally nice and funny guy, I got to say, but that was my story. So our three was, was, I was literally trying to like, trying to get out of that. it was i felt like i was in traffic school man it was rough that, but um that's funny I, I like the fact how you said that because we all here on uh, the show here a lot of us like the roth uh, I, I think it's a the popularity is probably 80 90 percent roth 10 percent other eras uh sammy gary things like that and i think we can all kind of get that dave is funny we love dave and he's funny as all hell and then after a certain amount of time we do like almost so feel like we're being held hostage this- like you said <laughs> sword swings both ways, man. Like it's like what make what makes him so. I mean, and I just saw him at the at the Hollywood Bowl. He had the audience in the palm of his hand. What makes him so such a gifted performer in that regard is also the Achilles heel because yeah. it's almost like whoa, you know. So, and for the record, I'm all Roth era. That's all I'm about. Like that's and, great. And, and, and saying that, I think Sammy, Sammy, Gary, all these guys, they're 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 magnificent talents. I would not hesitate to work with any of them at any time. I'd be be lucky to do so. But uh, only up to 1984. After that, man, I am out. I know. That's it. You know, it's, uh, for I, me, I mean, you know, and, and, and clearly the, you know, it, it's just the, the dynamic just changed. But you know, once again, Ringo's my favorite Beatle, so I don't know what to tell you. You know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. Like that's, it's all about that chemistry. Once it moved, just like I saw them with Wolfie Heath. I mean, talk about a talented fellow, man. Geez, I, I mean, I thought he played phenomenal. I mean, I don't think you could ask for a, a, a younger, sharper player. I mean. It's truly a gifted, talented guy. Seems like an exceptionally nice guy. Personally, it's just about the chemistry of the four for me. Mm-hmm. That's of really course, the, I agree. So, and, and I get it. I mean, I don't think you're going to find a better person to fill other than Mike Anthony than him. I mean, I agree. talent is undeniable. But um, it's just to me, that's just kind of that's the product I, I like. That's the chemistry I like. And I, once again, music's a fickle thing. You have to kind of yeah, it has to be right. Otherwise, it's just not you know so i agree with that 100 percent. and you know what's really cool i just i just uh, mentioned over in the chat i said i'd like to have you back on the show because i had probably about uh i think i had around 18 questions for you and i think we probably only addressed maybe five of them and there's a lot more van halen and like i was telling blues off the air uh, before we started here too i like to be very respectful of the guests i don't want to overload uh, each guest on van halen even though it's a van halen themed show there's always going to be a couple van halen themed questions there, there has to be or else you know who, sure. no one's going to come to the show um, you know, if, if you're not asking guests about Van Halen and things like that, it's, it's the nature. 
But now the fact that, you know, I got inside your head a little bit before the show, I got to know how much you really do appreciate Van Halen. Um, I want to have you back uh, whenever the time is good for you, maybe towards uh, the spring, uh, maybe, you know, with, in the first quarter, or maybe towards the summer this year. And we'll get into part two and uh, go into more in-depth Van Halen, talk more in-depth about your uh, film scoring and things like that, because that's awesome. Um, there's just so much we haven't touched base on, but see, here's the thing I could, I could run and I know you would do this as well. We could run till midnight, uh, my time here and I know you would do it, but I always want the fans to come back for more. And, uh, yeah. I, I think, I think you hit a home run tonight and I really want to thank you, uh, for coming on and sharing your insight and valuable knowledge and just, you know, and, and disclaimers as well. Don't do what I did because you could be, you could die, but you, know, you literally will die. That's you right. That's right. Yeah, no, I don't want anyone to get hurt. We're just we're just telling stories here. So that's right. <laughs> you know, but I, I, I hope- appreciate listen, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. And like I said, hopefully, my hope is that somebody will get something good out of it. That'll you know, because it's all just art and it's all good mm-hmm. stuff. And hopefully, somebody will find maybe some parallel that makes makes you know something make more sense for them. So that would be that would be ideal. But yeah, like I said, with me, it's honestly it's just a scheduling thing. It's it's the, the scheduling is just mm-hmm. there's a lot going on but you got to get you've got to get me dweezil and then get my dad on there to yell at both of us at the same time that would you be know awesome. what i'd love it and <laughs> and tell dweezil i think dweezil probably thinks i'm crazy by this point but i, I texted him off the air again well actually while we, you were talking a second ago i said he's talking about you right now so get him on here and then we're gonna have some fun and as a matter of fact i know he knows about this because i did a um uh the three greatest eruption tributes in in the world and i picked these three people who i think did um uh, the three best versions, and there's a young kid here up here in Canada, uh, Jacob Duraps. Um, he's a friend with Dweezil now. I heard of him. Yeah, I think Dweezil told me about him. He's yeah, he's great. So I picked him as number three. I picked Dweezil at the time as number two um, from his versions of Eruption, and then Pete Thorne at the time I picked him as number one. Uh, still, yeah. still on the fence, but Pete Thorne probably one of the best. Mike Kimmel's up there now as well, too, a friend of mine. But I, I know I get through some huge props to Dweezil, and uh, I and I know he's close with Eddie as well, too. But uh, well, yeah, I think honestly, he's, there's more with Dweezil. I think he's such a multifaceted uh, just artist. I think he's it's an interesting. I think your fans would would really uh, there's so much more to him than I think people realize. Oh, I know uh, a lot of layers. He, yeah, a lot. I mean, he literally, and I kid you not, he stopped. I mean, I knew it because I was there. I'm like, you are crazy. He stopped, and he stopped. He literally retaught himself. Took about a year maybe a year and a half to redo so we could do stuff that his dad did that wasn't even meant for guitar. I mean, the dedication is crazy. I mean, how can that's such a crazy story? I gave him a hard time every day. I'd call him up. I'm like, you can quit yet? Like, nah, it's interesting. You know, and then even guys, guys like Pete, I know Pete, he's a, mm-hmm. an exceptionally phenomenal talent as well. I mean, there's a lot of talent out there. You've got a lot of, a lot of stuff to, to, to work with, you mm-hmm. know, for that. So, but I, I highly recommend if you can get Dweezil, I would, I would highly recommend that. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to be in touch with you again. And I know even today might not have happened because your schedule is so erratic all over the place, but when you have a, a hole that's open and I'll give you a week's uh, week or actually I'll give you a whole month of range and something that works out again, I want to get you back on here. And I know the fans would love to have you back and the show will be all yours. Great. Great. Well, I appreciate listening and I appreciate everybody tuning in and listening to all the, the questions. I, even though I don't, uh, you know, I just, my, obviously my, my career has gone on a completely different path, but I always do appreciate the people that really, that truly got it and appreciate it. I, I appreciate that a lot. So. They do. They like you. The comments in the chat are great. I mean, the, I, I, I think uh, we were blessed tonight to have you. So very, very appreciative. I'm going to say goodbye okay. to you off the air and thank you everyone for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Uh, just as a reminder, I am back live again tomorrow for any regular time, three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I have Jim Reed from Stewart Travel Guitars on the show. It's going to be a fun, uh, fun chat as well. Looking forward to uh, having you all back. It's been a busy week this week. So Blues, all the best to you. Uh, have a fantastic uh, kickoff to 2018 and we'll keep in touch and we'll get you back on the show very soon. Awesome. So don't go away. I'll say goodbye to you off the air. Thanks everyone. You rock so much. I really appreciate you being here tonight. Have a great weekend. Cheers. I am now on Patreon. If you enjoy my content and wish to support my channel and what I do, then please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash evhgeartv. Your support assures the continued growth of this channel and a fun community in which to share our love for Van Halen, music gear, and much more. Hey, my name is Eric, and I'm playing the Frankenstruck guitar. Video production services provided by Design 39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs.